I borrowed heavily in creating this presentation from a colleague of mine at the GBIF Norway in Oslo, whose name is Dag Andresen. And so all the pretty pictures in this presentation are due to him. <laughs> but I did change it significantly for the purposes that we have here. So the things that I will talk about are fairly straightforward. What are persistent identifiers? Where would I use them? Show me some examples of what they are and tell me something about their characteristics. And then, okay, if I've convinced you that they're of some use, where do you get them? How do you, how do you get them? And finally, what are the benefits? Followed by a very brief um, demonstration, not demonstration, but a, a description uh, of one example of the use of IDs in a digitization workflow. Identifiers, you remember yesterday that I was discussing the relationships between two tables and I discussed the idea of parent and child relationships. And one of the things that I talked about was identifying myself in relation to my father. I am the son of my father and he is the father of me. So he has an identity, him. I have an identity, me. And it's these identities that we use to relate each other, relate to each other. So basically, very basically, the purpose of an identifier is to name things and make it possible to refer to them. I'm John, that's an identifier for me. It's not a globally unique one. There are plenty of Johns in the world and that's why no one calls me John. I have plenty of nicknames. It's kind of fun to be John because no one calls you your name. What is an identifier then? Here are three different definitions that have evolved over time from different sources to try to describe how an identifier is used in the modern digital world. So, Coyle in 2006 says, each identifier refers to one and only one thing. It's identity. If it ref one identifier referred to more than one thing, it would be less useful. John Kuntz in 2003 says that it's an association between a string and a thing. Completely different viewpoint on what it is. What John here is trying to say, another John, mind you, I was in a room with this John and a John Deck and I don't know how many other Johns. I was the only one who had a nickname to distinguish me. I was the only one who had a unique identity. Anyway, this John says, and he's interested in uh, metadata, he's interested in the actual string of characters that one uses to identify a thing. So he's thinking very much digital. He's thinking very much metadata. And that's the way in which we will use identifiers in sharing data. And then Campbell in 2007 tries to get a little bit more rigorous. And he says, a stated association between a symbol and a thing. Okay, so not necessarily a string, but an association or a relationship. And that symbol may be used to unambiguously refer to the thing. So, same as this, one and only one, unambiguously, refer to a thing. But Campbell adds that that is within a given context. So the given context is the sort of thing where I talked about options for identifiers. For example, you might have an identifier in your own database or spreadsheet but it's only meaningful to you. It's not meaningful to the rest of the world and it's not necessarily unique within the whole world. So this context becomes important when we talk about identifiers. I'm going to quickly go back to Darwin Core to discuss the use of Darwin Core or the use of identifiers within the Darwin Core because we're all interested in sharing the data that we end up capturing, I hope. So this is one example of an identifier that we've already seen. It's the occurrence ID. And what my colleague has highlighted in blue is that we would like for it to be a persistent, global, unique identifier. The recommendation of the Darwin Core is that it be a persistent, global, unique identifier. 
And if there isn't one, construct one. Construct one that makes it unique globally. In the comment, it describes a method for doing so, if you don't have some other way to do it. So for specimens, it's speaking specifically for specimens, that in the absence of a global unique identifier, that one could construct one from a combination using this pattern. First begin with these letters URN, then with catalog, and then substitute in this portion of the string what the institution code is. Colon again, and then substitute in this portion of the string a collection code. And then in this portion of the string a catalog number. The idea being that if catalog numbers are unique in collection codes, and collection codes are unique within institutions, then this string should be globally unique. And in fact, not only should it be globally unique, but you should be able to recognize as a human something about what it means. Okay, we don't really know yet what this part is. We will before the end of this talk. But this part, we know what an institution code is because Darwin Core tells us what it is. We know what a collection code is and we know what a catalog number is. So as long as the collections are cataloging without duplicate catalog numbers, this should uniquely identify an occurrence. So this is a way for us, not knowing anything about global unique identifiers yet, to construct one that is, should be useful throughout the world. There are some limitations on this, and now I'm going to go through the rest of the information about global unique identifiers and discuss why this could be good or bad. <coughs> Down here are a couple of examples once we're finished constructing this string or this identifier and what they would look like. So here's one that's UN, uh, URN LSID NHM.KU.EDU HERPS32. So this should be catalog number 32 in the HERPS collection at the University of Kansas. Same here. This should be catalog number 145732 in the mammal collection at the Field Museum. So it's uniquely identifying those specimens, hopefully. This is not meant for you to read so much as to be able to see highlighted in blue throughout the whole list of Darwin Core terms. You can see them in plenty of places. Here, 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 plenty of them here. And all those down there. All those blue are identification fields in Darwin Core. They're meant to contain global unique identifiers. So Darwin Core is very insistent on being able to share these. Now we need to know when an identifier is good enough. So remember Coyle said that it had something to do with a context. So within a context something should be unique and it should be persistent. So, he says, the common experience is that an identifier is created within a system or within a context and that at a later date it needs to be used in another or larger context. So we were talking about having our Excel spreadsheets and in it having an identifier, identifier for our rows. When I worked yesterday with Moses, he had identifiers for his photos and they were 10, 11 and so on. Those have meaning to him. As it turns out, the meaning is those were the significant digits on the file name for the photo. If you look at the file name for the photo, they would be something like DSCN underbar 00010.jpg. So it uniquely identified it for him. He knew what photo it was. But if he gets a new camera and he starts taking photos, the tenth photo that he takes will be DSCN underbar 00010.jpg. Exactly the same name, file name, as before. So what will he do? He runs into a problem of context because he got a new camera. So he had an ID that was unique and within the original context of having a single camera for his career. But he runs into a problem when the context changes and becomes larger. 
It becomes larger when we start to share our data as well. That's when those numbers also need to be unique within a larger context. So here, there are just a list of a few of the different kinds of contexts that are of interest to us. So within a single museum collection, like the HERP collection at the University of Kansas, the catalog number should be sufficient to describe uniqueness and should be sufficient to create an identity for the specimen. But now if we go within all of the University of Kansas natural history collections, the catalog number is no longer good enough. We need to know the collection code and the catalog number. And if we go to a broader context, all of the collections in the world, there will be plenty of HERP collections in the world with that catalog number. So now we need to add the institution code. When we go to the internet, and we're talking about not just specimens, but all kinds of things, everything that might be identified, literature, all of it, then we need a system that is generic and can handle our identifiers and our identifiers fit within that scheme. So I'll talk about some of those. So what we're really interested in at this point in terms of the identifiers is connecting data together. Being able to refer one piece of data to another across the whole of the body of knowledge and the whole of the digital domain of information. So, I've come up with a list of some of identifiers that are possible. These are ones that have a potential for relevance for biodiversity. We've already talked plenty about ID columns in a spreadsheet. We talked yesterday when we discussed modeling and databases, what primary keys are in a database table. Those are identifiers. And then we have a series of other ones a universally unique identifier, or UUID, a universal resource name, or URN, a life science identifier, a digital object identifier, URLs, and PURLs, pearls. So among these, in your careers, you've probably created some of those. You if, might have seen these. You saw one of those just a minute ago, and that might have been the first one you've ever seen. You've probably never seen one of these. You, if you read literature, have seen these for sure. You all have seen these. Every time you go to Facebook, you're putting one of those in your browser. And you may or may not have seen one of these. So it gives you an idea of the persistence of these kinds of identifiers in the world. That one, everyone has seen. 